Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I'm sorry I was a little late. Come, I think all of you have been waiting for some time. We have caught up with another program before this. We couldn't wind up in time. Very happy to see so many devotees and interested people gathered here. I didn't expect such a large gathering. So I'm very happy to see all of you this afternoon. <coughs> I'd like to thank <coughs> Rajanath Prabhu and Sadhamati Devi for their hospitality, for extending their home. So all of us could gather together to hear some spiritual messages, messages from the spiritual world. <coughs> the spiritual message is a very urgent message. It's a message for now, immediately. If there's no time to waste. Spirituality is not something that can be postponed for a convenient, comfortable time in the future. That future will never come if we keep on postponing it. Our spiritual needs are our greatest needs. Our most urgent needs. <clears throat> because if this one need is taken care of, everything else will be taken care of. So when you are hungry, all you want is food. If someone shows you, look, I'll give you this nice car, or I'll give you a nice mobile phone, or I'll give you some nice house, it doesn't interest us so much. All we want is food. When you're sleepy, and really sleepy, all you want to do is to go to sleep. If someone's telling you a nice story or something, you're not interested because all you want to do is sleep. So, what makes things simple is that we are able to recognize that I am sleepy and therefore I need to sleep. I am hungry and therefore I need to eat. So it's fairly easy and straightforward to recognize the problem and where the need is and how to fulfill that need and satisfy oneself. However, in this world, everyone is to some or the other degree dissatisfied. Yeah, please check your mobile phone. Yes, I forgot to make that announcement. Switch off your mobile phones and your children. <laughs> yeah, please check. You know, one thing I did in Vrindavan Temple one time, before I gave the class, I announced, please switch off your mobile phones, and if anybody forgets to do that, then there will be a fine of 500 rupees. <laughs> <laughs> and it did happen. Somebody's phone went off. So I, I took a donation <laughs> for our Goshala. <coughs> so our Goshala in charge was very happy. <laughs> he made quite a bit of got quite a bit of donations on that day. <laughs> so in this world, everyone is dissatisfied. And the greatest illusion is when someone thinks I'm satisfied. In fact, that's the greatest tragedy of all. <coughs> if someone's got cancer, for example, which is going to destroy that person, and the person thinks, I'm okay, no matter what the doctors tell him, the reports are, look, the reports are like this, and you have cancer. He said, no, no. He refuses to accept it. Then that's very dangerous. Because then he will not take the treatment for it. He will not get better. He may or may not have the symptoms. But the symptoms are going to come soon. Similarly, in this world, nobody, but nobody, is happy and satisfied. And what are the symptoms of that dissatisfaction? <coughs> the symptoms are birth, death, 
old age disease, fundamentally speaking. And apart from that, there are numerous other factors that continually disturb us, continually agitate us. I think you all have experience that every day there are numberless things that annoy us and irritate us, isn't it? Right from the time you wake up till the time you go to bed, there's always something that you don't like. Maybe you didn't like the way someone said something or anything. So this world is designed like that. It is programmed to give us discomfort. So it is programmed to keep us unhappy. And you can do that later, please. There should be discipline. On no, I just want to switch it off. Yeah. So once we understand the nature of this world, then we see that it is a place of misery. Nothing but misery. Always something happening. The moment you want some peace, there's something that comes out of nowhere to disturb your peace of mind. One may go to the Himalayas, one may go to the jungles, but no peace is to be found there. Anyway, where are the jungles left nowadays? And what's the condition of the Himalayas anyway? So, there is no place to go to. So, in this material world, we are subjected to numerous stimuli for irritation and for annoying us. Even little children, they get so annoyed, you're forcing them to sit in the lecture, yes? From childhood to old age. They want to go and play, they want to make a noise, but the elders are keeping on telling them, hush, hush, keep quiet. So right from childhood till the time we die in the world, there's constantly something happening to disturb our mental equilibrium. So now wherein lies the problem? If we could pinpoint where the problem lay, then we could try to find a solution. As I was saying, when we were hungry, it was easy to pinpoint the problem. I am hungry and the solution is food. I am sleepy, the solution is sleep. But for this general discomfort and unhappiness that everyone seems to be suffering from and which most people like to deny, what is the solution? First and foremost, we have to find the problem. Wherein lies the problem? What is the specific problem that we are experiencing because of which there is this discomfort everywhere? Fundamentally and basically it is because we have lost our own nature. We have forgotten our own nature. And because of that, we are in a different world, a world that is alien to our own natures, a world that is not meant to be lived in by us. But somehow or other, we are here. Having pinpointed that, it is forgetfulness of the Supreme Lord who is our origin. It is a forgetfulness of our original state of consciousness that is the cause of all our problems. If we were to understand that this is that one problem that needs to be solved, and if we knew the solution to that one problem, then everything else would be solved. Srila Prabhupada explains it by saying that this process of Krishna consciousness, which addresses all our discomforts permanently, is like that one switch, which when we switch on, will turn the light on in our life, the light of knowledge, the light of joy, But we've been turning on and off the wrong switches. But Krishna Consciousness is that one switch 
which will brighten everything, everywhere, and make everyone happy. This is the real truth. This is the ultimate solution for all our problems. In this world, everybody being forgetful of their original nature are imagining themselves to be something that they are not. We are not this body. We are not the enjoyers. We are not the proprietors. We are not the controllers. But we imagine ourselves to be so. And we suffer as a consequence of that. It is a much higher principle to recognize that we are actually servants of God. We are servants of the world. To serve is a much higher position than to be served. In the world, however, they teach us the opposite. Everyone wants to rise, to be on the top, to be the number one, so that others can serve them, so that they can be above everyone else. This is the psychology or the mentality of the world. And that is precisely the cause of all our misery. If everyone wants to be number one, there is very little space at the top. How many number ones can there be? So there is a struggle. And then there is fighting, there is competitive envy, hatred, greed, jealousy, violence, killing, crime, terrorism. Everything comes because of this one problem. We want to be the number one. We want to be the best. We want to be the greatest. We want to be the enjoyers. Because we think that we are the center of the universe. The universe is meant for me. This world is meant for my enjoyment. That is the problem. We are not looking at this world as a playground of service. We are looking at it as a playground of enjoyment and controllership. How can I do things according to my plan and my desires for my happiness, for my enjoyment, rather than thinking, how can I do things for God's pleasure and for the service and welfare of the whole world? There is such a difference in this mentality. Because everyone wants to enjoy and enjoy and enjoy. So there is no limit to the conflict that takes place. Imagine that you are sitting on the, on the bank of a pond where the water is very calm and stable. You take a pebble and throw it into the pond. At the point where the storm strikes the water, there are concentric ripples that emerge from that point and go outwards and they expand indefinitely till they reach the banks and the larger the pond the more the ripples will be able to expand now try another experiment take two pebbles one in each hand throw them into the pond one pebble at one place another pebble at another place and the ripples start going outwards. What happens? After some time, there's a clash. The clash of the ripples, the waves clash. Why did the waves, the ripples not clash in the first instance? And why did they clash in the second instance? Because in the first instance, there was only one center. In the second instance, there were two centers. And therefore, the ripples that came out from each of those two centers clashed. Similarly, when we have one center for our existence that is common to everyone, that is the Supreme Lord who is the origin of each and every one of us. 
then there is no conflict. Because our purpose, our goal, the object of our service and love is one. But when we have separate goals, each of us has one goal, my enjoyment. Each of us is thinking, I want to enjoy. I want to do this. It is. So therefore we have so many little points. And from each point we want to expand our enjoyment. We want unlimited enjoyment. We want more and more and more. <coughs> so when everyone is thinking like this, the circles come and clash. And there's so many people thinking like this, so you have so many clashes. And that's the reason for all the violence and all the troubles in the world. Because we have become very self-centered rather than being God-centered. <coughs> so there's a difference between the two. So all we have to do is now to turn our focus from me and I to the world and to the Supreme Lord. And what is that one common focal point? That one focal point our ancient Vedas say is Krishna. Why Krishna? Why a Sanskrit word? Why an Indian word? Why a Hindu word? God is not Indian or Hindu or, or, uh, or of any other nationality or anything. God is God. Whatever Whatever may be our particular bodily identification, the Supreme Lord is the origin of every one of us. God is not Hindu or Muslim or Christian. God is the origin of everything. The origin of the entire creation. It's not that the Hindu God created one part of the world and the Muslim God created another part of the world, the Christian God created a third part of the world. And that the Hindu God, Muslim God, Christian God are fighting in the sky. These quarrels between the different religious paths are taking place simply because of ignorance. Because again, it is a self-centered spirit. It's my religion that's better than yours. My God is superior to yours. The question, however, is that God is nobody's monopoly. There is only one supreme entity. What does it matter which language we call Him? We may address Him as anything so long as we understand that He is that one supreme being who is the origin of every one of us. And of all the names of that supreme Lord, Krishna is the most intimate name because it includes all other names. Why so? Because the word Krishna means all attractive. Krish and Na. The all attractive and pleasing aspect of the Lord. That's why the Lord is addressed as Krishna. Whatever other names of the Lord you can think of in any language, in any religious faith, in any culture, means something. Now each of these meanings are included in the word Krishna. If someone addresses God as being all-powerful, power is one thing that attracts people. Intelligence is another thing that attracts people. Beauty, wealth, renunciation, knowledge, these are things that attract people in this world. It makes a person very attractive. By definition, the Lord is He who possesses all these attractive features unlimitedly. Therefore, He is called Krishna. Aishwaryasya samagrasya viryasya yashashasriya Jnana Vairagya Yoscha Yiva Sarnam Bhava Itindana 
the Vedic scriptures explain that this is the definition of the word Bhagavan. In Sanskrit, the word God is called Bhagavan. Bhaga refers to opulences, the attractive features, and, and Van refers to one who possesses. So God is defined as the one who possesses all possible attractive features and characteristics and qualities in unlimited quantity. And because Krishna has that, he is the Supreme Lord. This is the purport of the word Bhagavan. So the Supreme Lord Krishna or Bhagavan Krishna is also the source and the origin of the entire creation. The text Bhagavad Gita, the word Bhagavat also refers to Bhagavan. Gita is song. So Bhagavad Gita means the Gita or the song of Bhagavan, of God, of Krishna. So at the very outset, even before we have started reading the Bhagavad Gita, we understand that this is the song of God. It's not an ordinary book. And it's a book where the Lord is declaring Himself to be the Lord. There are many other books where somebody declares that person is God. But here, Krishna comes and says, I am God. Worship me, surrender to me, love me. He's not saying that out of a sense of ego that we have. If one of us were to say, worship me, then that would be ego. And that ego is a false ego because I am not actually worthy of that worship. I am an infinitesimally small living entity who can be finished at any moment. But God is not like that. God is truly everything He says He is. You know, you must have noticed sometimes when two people have an argument and get annoyed with each other, and then one person will tell the other person, who do you think you are? <laughs> yes? Very common? Because the other person is talking in a way that indicates that he thinks himself to be something more than what he really is. And what are we? In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna explains our nature. We are the eternal spirit soul. We are spiritual <coughs> sparks of His spiritual energy. And what is our size? We are one ten thousandth of the tip of a hair. Try this experiment. I can't, but you can. <laughs> take, uh, take one hair. Take the tip of your one hair, cut it into hundred parts, if you could. Take one of those parts, again cut it into hundred parts. That one tiny part, that's the size of the soul. And that soul lives within the body, within the region of the heart. And that is the soul that powers our body. It's the same soul that powers the body of a germ, the body of a human being and the body of a giraffe or a whale in the middle of the ocean. That one tiny little soul. Now in this little speaker, the microphone, we have one or two batteries. How much is the voltage? Maybe 1.5 volts each or maybe 3 volts each or something like that. Just a couple of volts and it can generate just so much power. Can this run the powerhouse to power the whole of Melbourne city? No, it's not possible. How can such a small cell, a battery run or give power to the whole of Melbourne? So we might think that how is it possible that a tiny soul that powers the body of a germ, that same soul in its next life could power the body of a gigantic blue whale in the sea or a giraffe or an elephant. And that's the miracle of spiritual energy. 
And this spiritual energy is just one ten thousandth of the tip of a hair. It is that tiny, a fragmental portion of Lord Krishna's spiritual energy. So we just get an understanding of how great the Supreme Lord must be. So when there is such an argument, who do you think you are? The person who is asking the question perhaps doesn't realize how deep and philosophical a question it is that he has just asked. <laughs> yes? He says it in a moment of anger. But the fact is it's such an important and deep question. Who do you think you are indeed? What an important question, the most important question we can ask ourselves. Who am I? And who am I? I am just one ten thousandth of the tip of a hair. That's who I am. But still, the nature of illusion, the nature of this false ego is such that even though we are absolutely negligible and insignificant, still the ego makes us think of ourselves as something quite exceptional. There is a saying in English that even the pauper is proud of his penny. A pauper may have 50 cents, but if another pauper has 20 cents, he think I'm better than him. <laughs> because I've got 30 cents more than him, so I'm better. This is the nature of the ego, the false ego. But that doesn't mean that ego is wrong. Ego exists. Ego means I am. That I-ness cannot be destroyed. That I, the real I, is the soul. That tiny spirit soul is the real me and the real you. That is the true ego. But the false ego arises when we think ourselves to be something other than this spiritual spark. We think ourselves to be this body, this material body. And then we make all these distinctions. I am this, I am that. I am Indian, I am Japanese, I am Australian, I am African, I am Hindu, I am Muslim, I am male, I am female, I am rich, I am poor. Then all these divisions start based on this false ego, this wrong idea of who I am. So when we understand who we are and understand that our service is to understand the Absolute Truth, Sri Krishna, and to serve Him and love Him. That, as Srila Prabhupada explains, is the one switch that will brighten up everything in the whole world. And the world will then become the spiritual world. Krishna is a complete conception of the Absolute Truth because He includes all other conceptions within Himself. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur used to tell that humorous little story about six blind men wanting to know what an elephant was. Actually, this was a famous a poem, and I still remember we read it in our school days. The six blind men and the elephant. It was called something like that. So one time the six blind men, they they decided that they wanted to find out for themselves what an elephant was like. So they went, they thought, let's go to the king, because the king has many elephants, and we'll request for his per request his permission. So the king happily gave his permission, okay, go to my stables. So they were escorted by the elephant keeper. So one blind man, the first one, immediately went to the elephant and he caught hold of the elephant's leg and said, yes, I know what is an elephant. An elephant is just like a tree. <laughs> the second, second blind man came and he went under the elephant and he felt the belly of the elephant. He said, no, no, my friend, you are wrong. Listen to me. I will tell you what an elephant is. An elephant is just like a drum. The third blind man, he went behind 
and caught hold of the tail of the elephant. He said, both of you are completely wrong. Take it from me. This is true knowledge. The elephant is actually just like a rope. Meanwhile, the fourth blind man came to the front. He caught hold of the trunk of the elephant. He said, my dear friends, all three of you are wrong. Listen to me, for I shall give you the truth. And the truth is that the elephant is just like a snake. The fifth man, meanwhile, caught hold of the tusks of the elephant. And he said, oh, how silly of you. All of you are in gross ignorance. Listen to me, I have discovered the reality. The truth is that the elephant is just like a spear. And then there was a sixth blind man. Somehow he managed to clamber on top of the elephant. He went to the top of the elephant and he felt the ears of the elephant. And he said, he started laughing loudly and he said, all my dear five friends are in such deep illusion. You do not know what an elephant is, but hear from me, the elephant is just like a fan. <laughs> and then each of these six blind men, the blind people, they began to argue with each other. And eventually their quarreling reached such a crescendo, they began to beat each other. And the elephant keeper, with great amusement, was watching all this. Finally, he stepped into the picture and said, Look, my dear friends, let me tell you what an elephant is. Because he had clear vision. So he could understand and see what an elephant was. So then those six people quieted down. And then the elephant keeper explained to them, that all of you are trying to understand the elephant from your particular point of view. And it's not wrong, but it's incomplete. Your mistake is that you think that your incomplete vision of the elephant is the complete understanding. Because you don't have that vision, so you don't understand the complete picture of the elephant. Then he explained what an elephant is and what it looks like, the different body parts and so on. So similarly, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur explained that in trying to understand God, each one tries to approach the subject of God from a different point of view. And depending on each person's mentality, he or she understands God differently in different religions, in different cultures, at different times, different saints have explained things in different ways. And not that they are necessarily wrong, but it's not necessary that they also represent the complete truth. Something need not be the complete truth. Something may be partially true. But when we think the partial truth is the complete truth, that is where the problem arises, as it did with the six blind men. So in this world, we all quarrel with each other. My religion is right. My God is right. My way is better than your way. My way or the high way. <laughs> and that's why there's so much quarrel. And then comes along someone who is actually self-realized, who is spiritually so advanced, and he understands the Supreme Lord is beyond all these divisions. The Supreme Lord has nothing to do with all these divisions of being Hindu, Muslim, Indian, Japanese. God, the Supreme Lord, is the Supreme Lord. He's much higher, he's much beyond all these classifications and divisions. He is the source of everything. What is that fundamental definition of the Absolute Truth? He from whom everything emanates. Everything means everything, yes, including our money also. Mm -hmm. Everything comes from Him. So what does He look like? What kind of qualities does He have? It's very difficult to understand. Not easy. You and I cannot concoct information about the Lord. 
we cannot imagine something from our own imagination or our own intelligence. Therefore, we receive word from God Himself. When God says, I am God, then we accept that. But even those who accept Krishna as God could be under the spell of some incomplete understanding if they think that that's all there is to the Absolute Truth. In the sense that if they deny other perspectives of the Lord, other ways of understanding and looking at the Lord, if they're not able to accommodate that within this conception of Krishna, then even though they may accept Krishna as God, but still their knowledge is not perfect. As I said in the beginning, knowledge of the Absolute Truth in its fullest perfection includes all other types of knowledge of God. So Krishna, Srila Prabhupada explains, is the perfect and complete conception of the Lord because He is all attractive. Therefore, this principle of all attraction is all important. All attractiveness means that He has everything to attract everyone. He must have everything within Himself that is to be found within His creation and also that which is not found in His creation. Now, does God have a form? Or is God formless? This is a matter of debate always that has been going on. But a simple answer. If the Absolute Truth is the origin of everything, then He must have within Himself that which is found in the creation. Otherwise, how can He be the source? We see form in this world. So how can God not have form? But then a response may be given. But we also see formlessness. We see air which has no form. So does that mean that God is formless? Indeed, yes. He has a form and He is also formless. Both can exist simultaneously. That is what it means to be a complete Lord. If God is only formless or only has a form, He would be incomplete. But when the Lord encompasses everything that is within the creation, encompasses all the attributes that are found here and more, then yes, we can understand He is a Supreme Lord. Krishna is a masculine name. So is Krishna God? Is He male? Is He a man? What do you think? Why the silence? <laughs> what do you think? Yes, He's male to me. Everyone's thinking now. <laughs> it's good, you have to think. I narrate this incident that happened to me frequently. I might have narrated this in my trip to Australia this time, I don't remember. One time in a train journey in India, I was reading this book that had Krishna's picture on the cover. So there was one lady sitting across. Later I learned that she was a professor of something. So obviously she was not a very, she was not favorably inclined towards this kind of impression or understanding of God. So she looked at me and said, why does God have to be a man? <laughs> so I said, you know, madam, it's not my fault. <laughs> you know, if he's like this, what can I do? I didn't make him like that. He made me, as I am, he made you. I didn't make him like this. It's anyway, anyway, but tell me, why, why, why do you always portray him as a male? So why should God be only a male? It's a good question. 
Actually, her question was very valid, very relevant. So my question to you is now, I will turn the question to you to get some answer to solve my confusion. Why is God only a male? If he is complete and perfect, he includes everything. He has form, he has formlessness, he is big, he is small at the same time, he is everywhere at the same time, and he is only male? Why not female? So what would you say? Who would like to answer? How can God be complete if he is only male? That's the question that arises. He must also be female. Because we see in this world there is male and we also see there is female. So if God is complete and perfect, if he is only male, then how can he be complete? It's a good question. One answer, anyone? Uh, yes. Doesn't Krishna always have association of Radha? Yes. So is Radha God? Is God male or is God female? Or are there two gods? I was speaking to one Iranian girl in India before I came. She said, I'm not able to understand Radha. I'm trying to understand this philosophy. But I can't understand Radha. I said, even I can't. <laughs> Very difficult. She is the most exalted subject matter to understand. But anyway, say, tell me, what is it that you can't understand? She said, how is it that Krishna is God, he's a male, and there's a female, so who is God? Is he God? Is she God? Or are there two gods? So I said, no. Is one God. Radha Krishna is the absolute truth. Then I gave the example of the sun and the sunlight. The sun is a source of the sunshine. The sun is the energetic and the sunshine is the energy. Now the energetic and the energy are one and the same. At the same time, they are also different. Is there any meaning to the sun without sunshine? There is a sun, but it doesn't have any light, no heat. It's just there. What kind of a sun is that? Similarly, if there is sunshine, mustn't it come from somewhere? Mustn't it have a source, the sun? So sunshine cannot exist without the sun. And the sun has no meaning without the sunshine. So the two are very intimately correlated and inseparable. You cannot take the sun away from the sunshine. When we are sitting here in this room, the light from outside is streaming in. From here, for example. We say there is a sun, the sun is entering here. But when we say that, we don't actually mean that the physical sun globe has come into this room. We mean that the sunshine has come into this room. So it's not wrong to say that the sun is here because we are referring to the sunshine as being the same as the sun. At the same time, we also know there is a distinction between the sunshine and the sun. One is the energy, the other is the energetic. So the sun is a sun globe plus the sunshine. At the same time, because the sun globe is the origin of the sunshine, relatively, of the two, the sun globe is more important. Similarly, there is the energetic, that is Krishna. And there is the supreme energy personified by Radha. So the energy is the feminine. The energetic is the masculine. Together, they form the complete absolute truth. So all these contradictions are resolved in that one absolute truth. The Supreme Lord is bigger than the biggest, smaller than the smallest at the same time. He is so huge that from the pores of his skin the universes emerge. We are not able to understand the dimensions of even this one universe. 
such a large universe. And this universe is just considered by our scriptures to be a medium-sized universe. And there are innumerable other universes like this. And they all emanate from the pores of the skin of Mahavishnu, who is merely an expansion of the expansion of the expansion of Krishna. How big is Mahavishnu? Can we imagine? No, we can't imagine. So on one hand, he is so huge. And that same Supreme Lord can also enter into an atom. So he's holding up an atom, every single atom in creation, the Lord enters into that. He's also seated in our heart as a super soul. So he's bigger than the biggest and at the same time the smaller than the smallest. So all possible contradictions that you can think of and even those that you can't think of all are reconciled in that supreme absolute truth. That is why he's called the absolute truth. Where there is no relativity, there is no duality. <clears throat> so similarly this idea of male and female is also reconciled in this way. <clears throat> so the Supreme Lord, the Absolute Truth is Radha Krishna. <clears throat> so for those, there are those who worship Durga in India and they address her as Shakti and the Durga worshippers are called Shaktas because they worship the Shakti or the energy. So we see the terminology is already there, Shakti. So to worship only the sunshine is not complete understanding of the sun. To worship only the sun glow or to study only the sun glow is not a complete understanding of the sun. You must see the sun and the sunshine. Similarly, to understand the absolute truth, you must understand Krishna and also understand his energy. That is a complete understanding of the absolute whole. So this material world is also his energy. We the spirit souls are also his energy. So in that sense we are all his energy meant to be used in the service of the energetic that is Krishna. And therein lies our perfection. Unfortunately instead of trying to serve the Supreme Absolute Truth we become false gods, false enjoyers in this world and that leads to all our misery and discomfort. And even though we have spent millions of lives suffering birth after birth, somehow we don't come to the point of knowledge. Some fortunate soul may get the opportunity to come to the lotus feet of Lord Krishna and understand these things. It's a very rare fortune in this world. Very few people really are even interested in these things because they don't realize this is something so urgent as I was saying at the very beginning of the talk. This is the highest urgency for us because we have been living in this material world for billions of lives, suffering the pangs of birth, death, old age and disease. Now the time has come. We have a human form of life, which is a priceless opportunity for us to understand who we are, to understand what the Absolute Truth is, to surrender to the Absolute Truth and come out of this cycle of birth and death go back to the spiritual world and finish this problem once and for all. That is really what is required. That is why it is so urgent. Because death can come anytime. And when death comes, if we haven't completed our spiritual practices and attain perfection, then we will have to take birth again. And again and again, and the cycle goes on and on. 
Whether we are kings or commoners, it doesn't matter. We leave behind everything we take. There was once a king and he was diagnosed with a terminal ailment. And the doctor told him, you have very little time left, Your Highness. So you are going to die very, very shortly. So the king was very sad. Well, what could he do? He tried with all the possible doctors in his kingdom. Everyone gave the same verdict. Your Highness, we can do nothing about it. Your illness is too serious. We have only a few days left now to live. So the king was thinking, what should I do? I don't want to go away from this world. I don't want to live this world alone. But yes, I know. I have four queens and I'm sure they'll come with me. <laughs> They've accompanied me in this journey of life and they'll come with me as well. So let me go and ask them to accompany me in this journey. So he went and asked his first queen. He said, look, now I have to leave this world. The doctors have said, there is no hope. I have only a few days left. And then I will go on this long journey. I don't know where. So I have to leave this world and go. Will you come with me? So the first queen abruptly said, no, got up and walked away. And the poor king was very disappointed. Oh, I had so much hopes on this queen. In fact, I spent all my attention and energy pampering her so much and just see how abruptly she answered me. No, she stood up and walked away. So the king was very heartbroken. So what to do? Of all the four queens, I had given my greatest attention to this one queen. But she is the one who first and foremost rejected <coughs> me outright and said, I will not come with you. He said, anyway, what can I do? But still, I have three queens more. <laughs> so he went to the second queen. Look, I have to leave this world. I am about to die. So will you come with me? Now this second queen <coughs> was someone <coughs> to whom he would confide his, his, his problems. He would sit with, with her talk and she would give sometimes good advice. So he was thinking, definitely she will at least come with me because she's always given me good advice. She was there with me in times of need and so on. So he asked her, will you come with me on this journey after death? So she said, sorry, I cannot come also. So he was again heartbroken. So, oh, just see. I used to always go to her for help and this time she also says, I can't help you. Anyway, I have two other queens. He went to the third queen. And this third queen was noted for her beauty. And he would always take this queen out and display her, especially in the public functions and so on. He would like to have this particular queen with him because she was very beautiful. So everybody would see so he would like to display her. So he came to her and asked, Will you accompany me? She also said, No. Actually, the second queen had said that I'll only come to your doorstep with you. I won't come more than that. And the third queen, she said, No, I'll remain home. I won't come with you. Now the king was really losing hope. Three out of four gone have refused to help him. Now there was a fourth queen. Now this fourth queen was the one whom he had always neglected. He had never bothered to talk to her or look after her. He had ignored her. Somehow she was very faithful to him. So now when he came to her and described his plight and said, will you come with me in this journey? My other three queens have refused outright. And she outright said, yes, I will come with you. 
and the king was very happy. At least one queen has agreed to come with me. She was very loyal and very faithful. And there is a purport to this story. Who are these four queens? Who do they represent? And who is the king? The king represents the soul. The soul is trying to enjoy this world. He has got a kshetra or a kingdom. Just as the king rules over a kingdom and tries to enjoy himself, the soul also tries to enjoy this world. But to enjoy this world, the soul needs certain extensions or certain media, via mediums through which he can enjoy. The first and foremost is the body, the physical body. So the first queen represents the body of the soul that the soul occupies. So when the time comes for the soul to leave or to die, the body cannot come. The body will be left behind. The body will be either burnt in a crematorium or buried in the ground. The body will have to be left behind. So the first queen, when she answered that, no, I won't come with you, immediately got up and walked away, meaning that it's impossible for the body to come. The very meaning of death is that the soul leaves the body and goes away, doesn't come again. And the body is left behind lifeless for someone else to burn and bury. So the first queen represents this body. The second queen represents the friends and relatives that the living entity acquires in a given lifetime. Whenever the living entity is in difficulty, the person is in difficulty, approaches his friends and relatives for advice, look, I have this problem, what do you think I should do? But the relatives also can't come with us when we die. And the third queen represents our wealth. When we leave, can we take along our gold and diamonds and our money, our home? Nothing. Everything stays behind here. There is a verse in the scriptures that says, Dhanam bhumo pashu goshte nari grihatvare sakhas mashane When we die, our wealth remains buried under the ground. You see, in the old days, there weren't any banks. And when people had wealth, like gold coins or something like that, they would usually hide it, bury it under the ground somewhere, so that no one would know where it was. It was a safe place, and they would hide it. But when the person, the owner of the wealth died, he left, but the wealth remained in the ground. So, dhanam bhumo, so the dhana or the wealth remain in the ground. Pashu Goshte, one of the symbols of wealth in the old days was having cows and bulls, cattle. So the owner departed, left, but the cows remained in the cow shed. They remained, but the owner departed and left. Nari Grihatvare, the wife would come up to the doorstep because the ladies were not allowed to go to the crematorium. So they would come up to see the dead body up to the doorstep only. Sakhas Mashani and the friends of that man who died, they would go up to the crematorium and they would burn his body. So in this way, whether it's our own body, whether it's our wealth or our friends and relatives, everything is left behind. Are you going to ask me a question now? <coughs> Hmm? Fourth wife. Who is the fourth queen? The karma. Huh? The karma. Knowledge. Karma, okay. Knowledge. Knowledge, all right. In a sense, all of you are right. But specifically, the fourth queen represents dharma. Our spirituality. That spirituality, that spiritual inclination, those spiritual 
performances that we have done, practices that we have done, will actually save us, they will carry us, they will accompany us to the next life. And also the karma in general. Because the actions of whatever we do in this life will follow us like a shadow in the next life. The scriptures explain that in as much as the shadow follows a person or a calf seeks out its mother cow even in the midst of a few hundred cows, similarly the results of our karma seek us out wherever we may be in, in the universe, in whatever form of life we may have taken birth in. But uh, the results of our karma will come and catch up with us. And if we have lived a very spiritual life, then that spirituality will actually save us and take us to eternity. Take us to the spiritual world. But if we haven't done that, then we will have to take birth again. The first three are fallible soldiers. They will be able to help us only up to a point. So long as we are alive, they can help us. But our spiritual activities, the fourth queen, will actually be our real friend, who will help us even after we have left this body, left this world and gone ahead. So this is a real friendship that we should cultivate. He is the Supreme Lord. The fourth queen represents actually the Supreme Lord sitting in our heart, who is always accompanying us. Wherever we go, life to life, life to life, the Lord as a super soul in the heart accompanies the living entity. Even though the living entity may have assumed the belief of an atheist, but the Lord is so kind. He never gives up that particular living entity who is also his child. Upatrashtam manta cha bharta bhokta maheshwaraha paramatme ti chap yukto te hismin posha paraha. The Bhagavad Gita explains that seated in the heart of all living beings is the Supreme Lord who is called the Super Soul who is the director of the activities of that entity, who is the witness, who is the Lord, the master and the real enjoyer of the activities. And when the soul leaves the body at the time of death, it happens under the superintendence of the super soul. And the super soul and the soul together leave. And according to the karma of that living entity, a next body is obtained. And the Lord is constantly with the soul in this journey of millions of lives in this material world. Such is a true friend. He doesn't give us up. In this world we see that we have some slight quarrel or misunderstanding with a friend and then we stop talking to that person. And we part ways. But the Lord is not that kind of a friend, a shallow friend. The Lord remains with us in every life as He has for millions of lives in the past. And He will remain with us as well in the future. But His real desire is that we should turn our face and look at Him. We shouldn't be like that king who ignored the fourth queen. And she was the only one who was actually faithful to Him. The other three queens gave up on Him. When He was in trouble, they just dumped Him. <laughs> A friend in need is a friend indeed. So the super soul, the supreme Lord Sri Krishna is our real friend, waiting for us, sitting there playing the flute. And we are saying, sorry, no time. I have other things to do. I have to attend the Grand Prix. I have to watch the football match. I have to go to the cinema. I have to make more money. But Krishna doesn't mind. He's waiting, 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 peacefully. Ever so faithfully loyal to us, never giving up on us. Such a friend is Krishna, the all-attractive Supreme Personality of Godhead. So now we should not make the mistake we have made in all these lives. 
this fourth queen we should not ignore. In other words, the Lord is calling us from within our heart. We have to respond to Him. Srila Prabhupada has given us this message in his books. If we read his books, hear his messages, and chant the holy names, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, then we will be able to reconnect with our long lost friend, who is very close to us, is in our heart, but we have forgotten him. We will be able to re-establish that connection and then go back to his kingdom where he is waiting for us. That is the perfection of life. I am very thankful to Rajanath Prabhu and Sadhu Mati Devi for having hosted us this evening and made such nice arrangements with all kinds of stratospheric acoustics <laughs> with a nice arrangements in different rooms and very nicely organized setup. Thank you for your hospitality. We pray to Lord Krishna, the eternal friend of everyone, that he may please bless them and their family with pure Krishna consciousness and that they may also bless all of us who are assembled here the Supreme Lord may bless all of us as well with pure Krishna consciousness. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask and I will try to answer. Maharaj? Yes. Yeah. One question. Uh, when you were, you gave that analogy of the story about the six blind men, mm -hmm. how is it, I mean, like we are all as you say, illusion, we can't see you know, the real picture. How is it possible in any way whatsoever to explain to someone who is blind what is a rope even? Or what is what is light? How, I mean, somebody who has never seen light as such, how can, you, how can anyone explain to him what it means to be a pillar, what it means to be a tree, to a blind man, what is a tree? What is a rope? What is a spear? So, so the question is that how does one explain to a blind person what is a rope, what is a spear? In other words, if someone is completely unaware about Krishna, how do you explain to that person about Krishna or about the absolute truth? Well, to start with, some analogies are good. At least there is some understanding. Like you can make the person feel a spear or make the person feel a rope. He has at least a sense of touch in order. Something is there. So he has some little idea. But eventually, what the Supreme Lord does via his pure devotees is he operates our eyes, our spiritual eyes. Because we are suffering from spiritual cataract. When there is cataract in the eyes, one cannot see clearly. The vision is obstructed. But by a surgical procedure, the cataract can be removed and then one's vision is restored. <clears> Om Jnana Timiram Dasya Jnana Anjana Shalakaya Chakshur so the spiritual master is one who performs the spiritual surgery. Shalaka is, a, is an instrument that is used for eye surgery. So here we're talking for spiritual instrument, a spiritual surgery. He performs a spiritual surgery on our spiritual eyes which have been covered over by the dense darkness of ignorance and restores our spiritual vision so that we can see things for what they are. In other words, it's a question of surgery. <laughs> that is the job of the pure devotees like Srila Prabhupada, who have given us this information 
this process and if we simply follow it, then our vision will be restored. Okay. Any other questions? Just on this one. Yes. <coughs> so when this spiritual surgery is performed, are you able to see the Supreme? When the spiritual surgery is performed, are you able to see the Supreme? Yes, indeed. But, what does it mean when you say you see the Supreme? We, you see, this surgery is performed not on the eyes, interestingly. This surgery is performed on the ears. Sounds strange, isn't it? Each day we hear something strange in our classes. The Bhagavatam uses a phrase, Shrutekshita, to see with one's ears. How is that? Because unless we gain knowledge, which is done by hearing, our vision will not be restored. It's not a question of physical surgery. Let me, let me give a simple example. Let's say somebody is sick and he goes to a doctor and the doctor says, you get such and such blood test done and you get this x-ray report. And the person goes, gets his pathology reports and his x-ray films. But when the patient looks at the blood reports and the x-ray films, he can't make out anything. It doesn't make any sense to him. He just sees a few numbers, some terms. He sees a film, he just saw some patches somewhere. <coughs> he can't understand anything. But the moment the doctor sees that, he says, oh, I see, so this is your problem. And he looks at the blood report. Yes, yes, it tells us. This is, this is the problem. Now, the blood report and the extra film the doctor is seeing is the same that we have seen. Why is it that it makes so much sense to the doctor? It doesn't make any sense to us. Does he have some special glasses or some miracle goggles or something because of which he suddenly sees something that we don't see? So, of course, questions have come. Okay. <laughs> So the answer is that simply physically seeing is not it. Gaining knowledge will make us see things which others can't see. Will make us understand things which others can't understand just by looking. <clears throat> or let's say a car mechanic. Someone who has learned how to repair a car. If someone's car breaks down and he doesn't know anything about repairing a car, he will look at the machine and be nonplussed and perplexed. He doesn't know what to do. He has no idea what's, what could have gone wrong. But a car mechanic who's experienced comes along. Okay, what happened? He just tinkers with it for two minutes. Okay, this is the problem. Sets it right and goes away. The engine, the car that he sees is the same as that which we see. But he sees something that we don't see because he has gained knowledge. In the same way, when you look at the deity of the Lord, we are actually seeing the Lord. But because we haven't heard, we haven't got knowledge, and therefore there is no faith and no spiritual vision, so we may see just as some deity, just some statue, or just some marble, or just a statue of metal. But when by hearing and practice that spiritual vision develops, then we understand, yes, here is the Supreme Lord. One doesn't have to be like Arjuna seeing Krishna face to face when he spoke the Bhagavad Gita. One may see the Lord in the form of the deity. One may hear the sound representation of the Lord in the form of the holy names or in the form of the Bhagavad Gita and the Srimad Bhagavatam. And that is as good as seeing Krishna face to face as Arjuna did. So this is self-realization. Self-realization is a matter of having that staunch faith and belief and understanding that this is the Lord and developing <coughs> love for Him. Okay? Yeah, let me deal with these official looking questions. <laughs>
My question is, when we hear any lecture, the influence stays for two or three days. <laughs> After that, we start getting involved in the material world. What should we do in that situation? So here lectures every two, three days. <laughs> or preferably every day. That's the best. We should do that. Any other question? Yes. yes. Maharaj, you mentioned that uh, Mahavishnu is an expansion of expansion of uh, Krishna. Yes. Uh, what is the reference, Maharaj? Is it mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita? Reference is the Srimad Bhagavatam. If you can mention, the, if you can, it's possible to give the word. First canto, oh, it's numerous places. <laughs> numerous places. In the first canto, second canto, third canto. Any specific words? No? Oh, there are many verses. <laughs> We will show you in the, the chapter after chapter is mentioned. Not one time. Yes? So if you just go through, take up the volumes, and you'll see many, many references to that. Okay? Any other questions? Yes? Uh, you are talking about uh, uh, Vishnu. Vishnu. Yeah. What about the Lord Shiva? Like, because uh, in other... Uh, Books it is that you know, there are three uh, gods like Vishnu, Shiv, and Brahma. Uh, so, about, what's that? Now, the question is what about Lord Shiva? Again, from the point of view of the Srimad Bhagavatam, Lord Shiva's position is very special. He is almost God, but not quite. It's a big topic. <laughs> cannot be discussed in a short time, but he's almost there. And the difference between Lord Shiva on one hand and Lord Vishnu or Lord Krishna on the other hand is the difference between yogurt and milk. Is yogurt different from milk? What would you say? So the but is there, isn't it? Is yes, but no. In other words, yogurt is the same as milk, at the same time it's also different. Isn't it? So the same way with Lord Shiva and Lord Krishna. He's the same as Krishna, but still he's not the same. So if you want to find out more about this, you will have to attend more classes, you will have to read more of Srila Prabhupada's books, then these <coughs> concepts will become clear. Okay? But Lord Shiva is a very worshipable personality for us because we understand him to be a great devotee of Lord Krishna. Okay. I think people are impatient for prasadam. <laughs> So we won't stand in the way. So thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.